Hello everyone and welcome to this educational session on repeat expansions. I'm very grateful to the organising committee for the opportunity to talk about some exciting advances in the field of expanded repeat disorders. My name is Paul Lockhart and I'm group leader of the neurogenetics at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute in Melbourne, Australia. My background is neurogenetics, encompassing both gene discovery and functional biology, and I have no conflicts of interest or disclosures to declare in relation to this work. This is an educational session. The brief is to give a general basic introduction to a particular topic, but at the same time introduce the latest exciting science that is coming out. Therefore, the structure of this presentation will be 1. Background into repeat expansion disorders. 2. The drivers of recent research, and this has been framed by the Australian experience, but similar issues confront many countries and so the underlying research and clinical imperative is likely to be widely applicable. And 3. The utility of short read sequencing in the context of repeat expansion diagnostics and discovery, and some final thoughts on current limitations and future directions. Neurological disorders are one of the largest disease burdens globally, affecting all age groups and very young to the elderly. These conditions have diverse causal mechanisms, with a high percentage having an underlying genetic etiology. This can be due to a single nucleotide change or larger and potentially more complex structural alterations in the genome. However, we now know that a very significant contributor to is expansion of a microsatellite repeat, representing a disease mechanism that was entirely novel only 30 years ago. Notably, expansion disorders represent some of the most common disorders seen by a neurologist in the clinic. So where do repeat expansions come from? We now know that approximately one third of the human genome, almost one billion base pairs, is comprised of some form of repetitive DNA. This includes functionally important regions such as telomeres and centromeres. Recent studies are also beginning to delineate the importance of other repetitive DNA, which contributes to the diversity both within and between species. The focus of today's presentation is short tandem repeats, also known as microsatellites. These are typically two to six base pairs in length and occur as a concatenar of up to 50 motifs. Short tandem repeats are inherently unstable during cell division and for many years that trait meant they were a hugely important genetic tool utilised for genetic linkage studies. However, the downside of this variability is that they can cause disease when expanded beyond a locus specific threshold. There are now over 40 disorders linked to expansion repeats. This slide presents a subset and aims to illustrate several important features of these conditions. Firstly, there is considerable variability in both the sequence and length of different STRs, or short tandem repeats, associated with disease. Secondly, the difference between a normal allele and a pathogenic allele can be very small. For example, in spinocerebellar ataxia type 7, only two repeats separate a normal and pathogenic allele. And finally, the location of the STR is not limited to the coding sequence of the gene. It can occur in untranslated regions of the cDNA or indeed within introns. As a result, there is a diversity in the pathogenic mechanisms associated with different repeat expansions, and indeed multiple mechanisms may contribute to a single disorder. The reality is that we don't fully understand disease mechanisms or modifying factors for the majority of repeat expansion disorders. I'm now going to focus on ataxia, and more specifically spinocerebellar ataxia, as exemplars of repeat expansion disorders. We know that a genetic diagnosis is incredibly important for appropriate disease management and treatment. However, in the case of ataxias, overlapping clinical signs are common and often multiple investigations are required to try and inform genetic testing. For spinocerebellar ataxia, more than 50 causal loci have been identified to date. And as you can see from this schematic, a significant proportion of spinocerebellar ataxia result from an expanded repeat, which by nature are very difficult to analyse. Diagnosis of expanded repeats currently requires expensive and low-throughput assays, specifically developed to interrogate a single expansion. Technologies, which include PCR allele sizing, repeat prime PCR, and southern blot illustrated here, have been utilised for decades. Generally speaking, these assays are specific for a single gene, complicated and laborious. 
Notably, they are not amenable to high throughput analyses preferred within diagnostic labs, and therefore only a minority of the most common repeat expansions are actually tested in diagnostic centres. The experience at Murdoch Children's is typical. The Victorian Clinical Genetic Services provides genetic testing to a population of over 5 million people. Approximately 250 individuals with clinical query of ataxia are tested each year with a diagnostic rate of just under 10%. Unfortunately, the National Health Service will only fund testing of the nine most common repeat expansions, meaning undiagnosed individuals generally face a long diagnostic odyssey. Options available to these undiagnosed patients include trying to be enrolled in a research project or self-funding additional diagnostic testing, which is often performed overseas and can be very expensive but still fail to provide a diagnosis. Whole exome sequencing as a government Medicare funded test is currently being implemented in Australia. Therefore, we trialled the likely impact on diagnostic rates in individuals with a clinical diagnosis of ataxia. 29 individuals negative for diagnostic repeat expansion testing were analysed by whole exome sequencing as a part of the Neurology Flagship Trial. A diagnosis was achieved in 7 patients, or 29% of individuals. Therefore, we predict that the maximum diagnostic yield for ataxia patients in Australia, utilising soon to be implemented standard care, will be approximately 35%. Clearly there remains considerable room for improvement. We know that whole exome sequencing is the predominant short read diagnostic platform utilised worldwide. It is relatively cheap and mature technology with computationally low demand. However, in the context of repeat expansions it has several limitations. For example, many repeats are outside the captured regions of the target. PCR is used during the process which can lead to errors in library preparation. And finally, repeat expansions are actually bigger than the average library insert size, so it is not possible to sequence across the entire repeat. Whole genome sequencing addresses several of these limitations, but the predominant commercial implementations still utilise short read whole genome sequencing technologies. An additional complication is that bioinformatics pipelines don't like repeat expansions. Because the sequence cannot align uniquely to the reference, indicated here by the coloured bars in the SCAR6 patient, the reads that actually identify there is an expansion repeat present are often discarded from the analysis pipeline. Therefore, we ask can we utilise current short read data to identify pathogenic expanded repeats by altering the bioinformatic analyses performed. Our hypothesis was that we didn't need to fully sequence an expanded repeat to infer it was present in a patient sample. Sequence analysis of a non-expanded tandem repeat generates read pairs that can flank the locus, shown in red in the schematic, or that can partially or completely correspond to the repeat sequence, shown in blue. All of these reads are likely to be uniquely mapped during sequence analysis and therefore contribute to analysis of, analysis of the repeat. In contrast, when the repeat is expanded, there will be many more reads that predominantly repeat sequence, shown in blue in the schematic, and they are usually discarded during alignment. In theory, however, we can use the other end of the DNA fragment, or the mate pair read, shown in red, to identify where in the genome the discarded read maps to, because the red anchor read is properly or uniquely mapped. Therefore, we designed an analysis pipeline to 1. Align the DNA sequence to the reference genome. 2. Identify anchor reads within 800 base pairs of known repeat expansions. 3. Retrieve any discarded mate pairs. And 4. Calculate the percentage of the mate pair read that is made up of the repeat sequence. And finally, we perform some maths to try and determine significance. What we really wanted to ensure during this process was that the output was able to be interpreted by non-bioinformaticians, particularly lab researchers like myself, clinicians and genetic counsellors. 
Therefore, we used empirical cumulative distribution function plots, or ECDFs, to demonstrate the results graphically. Essentially, what we are looking for is a shift to the right in the graphical plots of known cases, shown in colour, compared to controls, shown in grey. In our 2018 publication, we were able to show that the methodology was effective for 11 of 12 different pathogenic repeat expansions that we tested. So these results represent a potentially significant increase in diagnostic yield compared to standard care. And of course, many different groups had the same general idea, albeit using different algorithms and different methodologies. Therefore, what the research to date has shown is that it is possible to identify the majority of known pathogenic repeats with a single test, utilising short read whole genome sequencing. We suggest that the tools be utilised together, as they have different strengths and weaknesses, to provide a consensus result for each sample analysed. Implementation in diagnostic workflows is likely to result in a significant increase in diagnostic yield. Moreover, our calculations suggest that the use of a single test, eliminating the need for prior clinical investigations and multiple genetic tests over a period of time, is likely to provide a substantial cost reduction per positive diagnosis. However, there are some limitations to these tools. For example, if the size difference between normal and pathogenic alleles is very small, it's challenging for the algorithms to make a significant call. Moreover, the tools can only identify what they are programmed to look for. None of them can perform de novo repeat expansion discovery. This is a major limitation as we know that there are many repeat expansion loci that are yet to be discovered. To address this limitation, we developed Expansion Hunter de novo. Conceptually, this algorithm is similar to the previous tools in that it uses anchor reads to identify mate pairs that are composed entirely of the repeat sequence. However, it incorporates a genome-wide search for regions of repeat sequence that are enriched in cases compared to controls. To demonstrate proof of principle, we successfully utilised Expansion Hunter de novo to identify the novel repeat expansion that causes CANVAS, a rare late onset ataxia characterised by cerebellar ataxia, neuropathy and vestibular areflexia. This initially began as a traditional family-based linkage study that we initiated over 10 years ago. We collect a large cohort, ultimately involving 22 unrelated families and 35 affected individuals. We initially perform linkage analysis using SNP chip arrays, analysing four families. What we discovered was there was challenges with the linkage model and we were unable to identify genome-wide significant linkage. Indeed, we didn't identify a strong overlapping linkage signal anywhere. As a second step, we moved to whole exome sequencing and we sequenced 23 affected individuals from 15 families. Analysis of this data was unable to identify convincing linkage or indeed demonstrate any enrichment of rare or de novo variants in any coding genes. In 2018, we performed whole genome sequencing of two individuals from two additional families and managed to generate a linkage hit with near-genome-wide significance on chromosome 4. Analysis of the whole genome data, initially focusing on coding regions, again failed to identify any strong candidate variants. Similarly, inspection of the entire genomic sequence within the linkage interval failed to identify any plausible single nucleotide or indole variants. Therefore, we analysed the entire genome with expansion hunter de novo and identified a single candidate within the linkage interval, a repeat expansion in intron 2 of the gene RFC1. After eight years of extremely slow progress, we identified a candidate mutation in six weeks, the time it took to generate and analyse the whole genome sequence data. We performed standard molecular validation, including repeat PIRM PCR, and demonstrated that Canvas was due to the replacement of an approximately 11 motif 
AAAAG sequence with hundreds of copies of a completely novel AAGGG motif. And as often occurs in discovery projects, two different teams reported the same outcome at essentially the same time, providing irrefutable genetic validation of the discovery. There is not time to further discuss the two publications, but they provide a fascinating insight into the potential future of the discovery process in repeat expansion disorders. In conclusion, we are anticipating significant improvements in diagnostic outcomes for all repeat expansion disorders in the near future as a result of the application of new genomic technologies to what was previously a significantly undiagnosed cohort of disorders. Indeed, our preliminary data suggests rates greater than 50% will be readily achievable using current short-read whole genome sequencing technologies. The next three years are going to be an absolute boom time for novel repeat expansion discovery. Moreover, long read technologies are poised to provide unprecedented insight into both the size and composition of repeat expansions. Again, we are limited by time, but both PacBio and Oxford Nanopore have developing technologies likely to significantly impact this space in the next few years. Finally, in closing, Please see the next presentation in the session by Dr. Tabrizi for insights into how we are beginning to translate these discoveries into new therapeutic treatments. Thank you very much for your attention. There are many acknowledgements to make, and they are all listed here on this slide, but I particularly want to thank Haloom, Melanie and Mark at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute, David from Alfred Health, Igor and Mike from Illumina USA. This research would not be possible without the enthusiastic participation of patients and families. Thank you.